Welcome to the PR Resolution Podcast. I'm very excited about this episode because today we are talking about music and how it shapes cultures, how it can grow brands and ultimately drive business too. So fascinating. I'm interviewing two legends in brand partnership marketing. I'm joined by the ex-head of global music at Coca-Cola, Joe Beniotti, and also Rebecca Jolly, who is a global business consultant who's focused on growing business through culture. They have now teamed up together to work on a new book, which we're going to cover in the interview and get really into the detail on. But it was actually around five years ago that I met Rebecca, first of all. We were in Brooklyn and Rebecca was the CEO at Mixmag. We met at a Mixmag Lab live event, which some of you may know of. They were partners with Smirnoff. And just through that partnership, I saw a huge change in brand perception around Smirnoff throughout New York. And it was from that partnership. So it was from there that I could see that Rebecca was talented. From there, I've followed her career, both the brand side and music side. And now seeing that she's teamed up with Joe Belliotti on this new book, very exciting it's just hit as an amazon bestseller it's called how music grows brands it's the first of its kind and i think with the changes that we've seen in recent years of how people consume music and connect with brands and what they expect from brands this book is certainly needed so i'm super excited to have them on the show and to share all of this with you and so in our chat we cover how music can be measured in a brand strategy. You know that I love measurement. So we're going to get into whether it is actually measurable on the impact it can have. We also look at how brand strategy that contains music can really help with reputation. We look at both sides of a partnership, so the benefits it can have on the brand, but also the benefits it can have of an artist too. We also look at the relationships between the people involved in a partnership. So brands, artists, label, management, and how to navigate all of those shared objectives as well. We look at also how music can really change behavior, which is really important when we're looking at the audiences that we're connecting with. So whether you are in an agency, you're in-house in a brand team, or you're an artist yourself, I really feel like this is going to be helpful and it can spark some ideas. So here's Joe and Rebecca. Rebecca, Joe, thank you so much for joining me on the PR Resolution podcast. I know you guys are very busy, so I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Hi. So you guys are in LA right now, aren't you? We are. We're based in LA. Uh, Rebecca is over from London. Yeah, I'm just here for a whistle-stop tour of planning and talking about the book and things. So yeah, you've got it in the same place. Great. Well, my light will start to get darker. Anyone watching on YouTube uh, <laughs> where their light is still fine. <laughs> um, but let's get on to the book. So I actually want to start with the title of the book, How Music Grows Brands. And I want to start with a challenging question, actually. So how do we know that? How do we know that music does grow brands? Is it measurable? So the short answer is yes, if you know what you're measuring. And I think, you know, when you look at the potential on music, it can do a host of different things. It can amplify campaign messages. It can build brand equity. It can get you into new channels and, you know, reach different audiences. So there's a whole host of things that music can do. And ultimately, you have to decide, are you trying to drive brand love or are you trying to drive brand value? And then you can measure from there because that's the thing with music. It can do so much. You really need to understand from the outset what you're trying to achieve then absolutely is measurable. Yeah, and I mean, I think if you put together a music campaign with a brand, there's obviously all the metrics that you can measure against that as you would expect. So the reach and engagement and all of those. But I know that the reason you're asking the question is that some of it's because it's such a, a kind of passion thing and there's so much emotion with it. Some of that is hard to capture and measure. I think we're all very kind of certain, Joe and I, that when a brand starts to work in music, they need to start to invest in it in the long haul. And sure, you can create a campaign that will immediately get you some reach and it will work through artist channels. But I think that longer term investment into music scene and the music industry or whatever way you're choosing to execute through music, if you invest in it for the long term, then that's when you will be able to start to measure a real difference and also potentially directly relating to sales as well. You know, we have a couple of examples that we talk about in the book where we've actually seen music campaigns have an instant knock-on effect in terms of brand sales and brand traction, which is is always quite hard to achieve, but is also possible. So yeah, we would say yes, but you have to kind of really figure out ahead of time why you're doing it and what it is that you want to achieve 
and then measure against. A message that everyone hears in PR, set the objectives, know what you need to measure. Stay <laughs> with that though. I mean, you talked about investing on for the long term. That's sort of a point that I want to come back to. But you said that you go through a couple of examples in the book where you have actually seen an uplift in sales. That's really interesting. Could you talk us through at least one of those? <laughs> Yeah, I have an example that I always talk about because I always find it such an interesting example. And funnily enough, Stella, it's actually with a brand that we both have worked on historically in the past, as has most of the world, with Smirnoff. So I was working with Smirnoff in the US when I worked for Mixmag, which is a British music media company, which we launched in the US. And they were our brand partners and they were really struggling to get traction in the bars, in the on trade, in various areas of Brooklyn and also downtown LA. And so they kind of came to us with this problem. They were like, well, you know, we're selling, but we're not getting into the places that we wanted to be able to change the our brand positioning and reputation and kind of make it cooler. So we put together a program for them where we did the Mixmag Lab, which was um, DJ events with a really small crowd, but then streamed to millions. So we'd have huge DJs come along to these tiny venues in one in Brooklyn and one in downtown LA, streaming to millions around the world. And so we started to do that with them, just with a view of kind of trying to change the perception of their brand a bit and also get a, like a big reach through a music program. And then really within probably a few weeks of having launched these events, we were getting like, queues round several blocks in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And so it was really kind of changing the face of what Smirnoff was doing. And then we got kind of contacted by Smirnoff a few weeks after launching them. And they were like, it's absolutely insane since we started doing these events. We've managed to get listed in all the bars that were saying no to us before. It's completely changed like people's view of Smirnoff as a brand that's like a cool brand and should be in cool places versus not. I think they got listed in like 25 bars within the first few months of doing it that they weren't able to get in before. So that obviously directly had a knock-on effect on sales. And that's when I love that example because it's a real tangible example of like the shift that music can have in terms of what people think of your brand, why people buy into your brand, and yet ultimately driving revenue for the brand. Especially when it is a product like that, where it's not linked to online sales, which are easier to measure. It's always quite difficult to link marketing yeah. and brand partnerships to things like that. So it is a really good example. Plus, I was living in that area around that time and okay. uh, <laughs> can actually say it wasn't stocked in bars and then it was afterwards. <laughs> the book talked about a methodology that you guys have put it together. Is it Brand DB? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really kind of the intuitive things that Rebecca and I have done over the years, our sort of thought process. And we kind of boiled it down to these sort of key steps that we feel like, whether you're on the brand side or the agency side, or even on the music industry side, what should you be asking yourself in order to set up a partnership or an activation in the right way? And it starts, of course, with defining the picture of success and then finding out where brand and music intersect. Like, where can you actually contribute to music culture and vice versa? And then it gets into some criteria. So you see like, you know, what actually makes a great idea. A lot of it's used also to align stakeholders because there are so many stakeholders that get involved in music. That's the great thing about music is that it touches digital, it touches marketing, it touches PR, it touches, you know, every sort of part of the marketing uh, PR function and, you know, media. So how do you align the stakeholders? So we build criteria, and we're really trying to figure out like, you know, how do we make sure that people are doing things like creating shared value, considering the other side of the equation. If you're on the music side, how are you considering the brand objectives? If you're on the brand side, how are you making sure that you're helping to build the artist objectives or the festival objectives? So there's these steps that we put together and you know we turned it into a methodology just so people can go through the thought process that we go through when they're thinking about how they're gonna use music. Joe and I have approached everything in the book because it kind of works really well together with us because we both have worked on different sides of the industry. So Joe, was the global head of music for Coca-Cola for years. So was really rooted in the brand side and work building music programs on that side. And my experience is more agency, but then also music companies, whether it's music media companies or entertainment companies. So we kind of got our heads together and figured out where we'd seen things fall down before or where we'd both found like mutual areas where it had been really hard to sell a concept in it internally because we hadn't, we, and then we wanted to kind of provide this tool, which almost served as like a checklist and a rationale that made it really easy for everyone to either sell into stakeholders or get people on board with, or just really check that 
that they were going to be building. We've always seen a lot of music programs fail as well or not being as successful as they should be. So like, what are those kind of fail safe things that you really need to figure out and get right before you embark on one? Like before you choose a kind of arbitrary direction or whether it's a music artist to work with or a brand that doesn't feel like it's got the same shared values as you. So that's why we kind of crystallized it into that, the brand DB. And hopefully that's the kind of the real non-negotiables, I think, that you need to cover off when you're building a partnership like that. Uh, it really is the guidebook, isn't it, here? So it feels like there could be many layers to these kind of partnerships, but it feels like there's like three core areas. Correct me if I'm wrong, that there's the brands, there's music, artists, organisation, and then the audience. I've got questions around those three areas, actually. Probably starting with the audience, because... The brand wants to connect to them and feels like the music could be a good channel to reach them. How do you gain that kind of insight on the audience and what music will grasp their attention and potentially change their behaviour or really engage with them? We actually were talking about this yesterday because we're kind of starting to put together a kind of almost like a toolkit for um brands and it all when they want to work in music and vice versa and it all every conversation that we had to or every place we got to yesterday was working on the fact that it has to come from the audience first and that's the absolute like key identifier like what audience is the brand trying to reach and then working backwards from there or working forwards from there you have to go pretty deep on that as the very first thing I think you can't really make assumptions or dance around it and then build something that's going to resonate properly so I think you know people really go deep on the research for that they work with specialist agencies to really figure out what resonates with your audience do that kind of due diligence and go really look into exactly who it is you're trying to reach and what it is that they're into otherwise the rest of it's not going to be able to follow on from that on to a question around brand so and just the way that people consume music now has changed so much in the last few years rapidly in the last 10 years the changes in the way that we consume and purchase music, has that been beneficial to brands or not? I think that it, it's been beneficial. It's also added more complexity, right? There was a time when you could say, you know, Sprite was a brand that was into hip hop and that was it. And you could end there. But consumers don't think like that anymore. You know, they listen to 21 Pilots on the way to a dance concert and listen to Jay-Z on the way out. Like there's blurred genres. And I think that, you know, on top of that, you've got all these different consumption channels. Music is a fragmented experience. You have to go to Spotify to listen, YouTube to watch the video, Instagram to see the pictures, TikTok to see whatever. It's completely fragmented from a consumer perspective. So it does have complexities. But I think music is the through line, right? If you can have that great piece of music content, that great experience, that great activation, it can touch all of those channels. That in some ways it's made it a lot easier and in some ways it's made it so much more complex and to navigate. Because, I mean, I think we know Stella from my backgrounds working in PR, you used to be able to attach your brands to a big artist that was really easy to identify because there was a handful of them that were I kind of like legitimate artists that would work with brands and be able to get a massive reach on the back of it because they have their own huge following they achieve cut through and I think these days that's it's just not really possible to do that it's absolutely impossible to identify an artist or a genre and know that that's going to have a stronghold on the audience that you're trying to reach so and that's kind of why we wrote the book because it's just the complex of trying to navigate the industry and like where you should align your brand with musically is is really complicated and I think it also then comes back down to your audience that you're trying to reach and what it is how you want to measure this because you could still like throw millions of dollars or attach millions of dollars to an artist and kind of get that quick flash of like huge mass awareness or you can divert it into like if your objective is more like deeper levels of engagement you can divert it into lots of different channels and lots of different kind of music areas and artists and ways to execute through that and achieve much more impact for your brand but it's not that easy to do we were talking yesterday again about myspace and the fact you there always used to be like eight artists that you would choose and they would kind of be like your musical identifier and i just don't know how possible it would be to even do that these days it all changes so quickly and there's just such a volume of it that yes or you can create a music program really easily and really cost effectively but getting that cut through that you used to be able to get is just very different ball game i think 
you saying about MySpace just made me smile because it reminded me of <laughs> a campaign that I worked on many, many, many years ago, which I'd completely forgotten. And it was, it was like five artists. Yes, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Lily Allen, Dizzy Rascal. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, exactly. The vaccines yeah. were always my MySpace too, and I remember yeah. that. Yeah. How would you do that these days? There's a lot more options, but it's obviously a lot harder to a, achieve what you're trying to achieve or also get it right. With the change in the way that we consume and purchase music, it has made it slightly more of a challenge for artists to be fairly compensated for their work. Does working with brands actually help them? Is it a benefit to them in that way? I think brands play a kind of bigger and more integral role than they ever did. I think brands partnerships brand sponsorship was always something that was a kind of nice to have on top of the music success and the revenue that was generated through touring through album sales now I think it's actually in so many cases the kind of the lead way or can be the lead way that artists can actually sustain themselves and make a living through it that is not possible through those traditional revenue channels and I think COVID propelled that, obviously, because a huge portion of earnings for artists was taken away. And I think whether brands capitalised on it or not, there was a real opportunity for them to get deeper into the music industry and actually play a role that was, I think, just so much more positive than it ever has been before. I think that, you know, brands used to receive criticism if they didn't get it right or if they wanted to try and like label or logo or be involved with music. And I think now there's a kind of shift, I think, in opinion where people realise that that's a way that a lot of the music can actually happen these days, which it might not be able to be in other cases. So I think the role for brands has definitely shifted for the better, but it means that we all have to kind of, I think, work to ensure that brands are investing properly and wisely and as much as they can and as much as they do in sport. You know, we talk a lot about how much brands invest in sport versus music, where, but it's really music that needs the brand's dollars, I suppose, more than any other industry, I think, at the moment. Part of our hope for the book is that, yes, we want to see brands be more successful with their music activations because, as Rebecca said, they will invest more in the music industry and music artists, which is great for that ecosystem. And it also creates more interesting fan content and fan experiences. So if we can help the sort of parties get this right, it is the ultimate win-win-win. I just think of both of your answers there, the new or amplified roles in these different areas now, whether it's a record label or, or the artist manager, that marketing role has really come into its own in comparison to years before. It's a really important part now, I guess. And does that tend to be the label or do artists now have their own marketing person to try and set up these deals? This is interesting because you're seeing more and more the emphasis on the need for marketing in the music industry. Back in the day, you needed A&R people to go find the talent. Now the talent sort of surfaces itself, right? You know, streams happen, people blow up on social media, you know, the, the talent is there. It's like, how do you then take that talent to the next level or create that a career around that talent? And that's where marketing comes in. I think the labels are getting much more savvy and, and investing much more in marketing, as are the artists themselves. Artists are the ultimate marketers. I mean, if you think about it, like they have to start their career from fan number one. So by the time we hear about them, they've done something right. They've touched on something. They've resonated with people in a unique way to be able to have even, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand fans. So artists to me are the ultimate marketers. Stella, you mentioned um, when you were talking about MySpace before Lily Allen, and that's actually such a good example. I feel like she is such a good example of that changing curve or like marking that changing curve of, of artists really marketing themselves and not needing to rely so much on that infrastructure that was historically built around them. Because she obviously, she became MySpace famous before anything happened. She kind of built up that huge groundswell of audience and followers and whatever you used to call them on <laughs> MySpace and then kind of released on the back of that. So I, I think... She really marked that change of giving artists that autonomy to be able to make their own careers. But there is then still that kind of missing piece sometimes, which can be that revenue at scale, which I think is where, you know, we're looking to brands to come in. This podcast is brought to you by Coverage Book, the tool that creates beautifully designed reports with credible metrics you can be proud of. Head to coveragebook.com for your free trial. 
like you said, um, when you talked about sport, it's much more commonplace of an agent managing those kind of brand partnerships. But good to see it increase. You have both talked about the benefits of investing in music on the long term to really see those benefits. And that was something that you did at Coca-Cola. Could you give us an example of how beneficial that was having a a long term music program? Yeah, I mean, Coke is the ultimate long term music program. They did their first brand ambassador deal with an opera singer back in 1895, and they've been investing (laughs) in music for over 100 years. Wow. When you look at Coca-Cola and you start looking at the campaigns, whether it's the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and you look at the always Coca-Cola campaign, the first thing people do will come back to you the jingle, right? They don't remember the out of home. They remember the music. So, you know, music, especially with Coca-Cola, has sort of defined the different eras and defined the different sort of campaigns that they've had throughout the years. In my time there from 2010 to 2017, we did a lot with music to amplify the FIFA World Cup. We did music for the Olympic programs. We created a program called Share a Coke, which was created out of Australia, which had people's names on the packages. We flipped that a couple of years in in the U.S. and created Share a Coke in a Song, where we put 75 iconic song lyrics on packaging. So we had a lot of fun with music. We did a lot of interesting things. We created a partnership with Spotify and helped them expand around the world because our recognition at the time as Coca-Cola was greater than Spotify's. And, you know, we benefited by bringing this cool new music service to the world. So we did a lot of interesting things around music. And I think, you know, Coke had the license to do it because people felt like, you know, Coke and music go together like Coke and sports. I think there's other companies like Vans that have the license to do really interesting things in music and are doing really interesting things in music. Um, it was an incredible experience to be there and uh, sort of put those pieces together around, you know, music and Coke. Two examples that you've mentioned around Coke and Smirnoff. I know as a consumer, you instantly think that they're slightly cooler by the artists that they're working with or some of the music programs that they're running. Have you guys got any sort of examples from your own experience of how you have really made a difference or changed opinion of of audiences? Have you been able to prove that in the past? I mean, the ultimate example is Red Bull and Red Bull Music Academy. I mean, Red Bull is so much more known for its music program and its investment into the music scene than it is for the brand and the product. And it's a a kind of perfect example of, of going from like, an energy drink, which I think we sometimes forget, which is just like a canned energy drink to becoming like one of the biggest creators, like leaders, drivers of culture that everybody knows what they've done. Everyone has touched that at some point in some way. I mean, that's kind of like the North Star example of someone who has used music to completely change the perception of their brand to the point when, for better or worse, people sometimes actually forget what the brand and product is about. I think they're so focused on the program. You know, going back to your original question around, you know, measurement, there were things we could do, you know, to build in promotions and mechanics to drive the brand value side. But when it comes to the brand love side, there's that typical question that we had that almost every other brand has, is this brand for someone like me? And that is such a great question for music because music is really the most powerful signal of identity. Like we connect with each other. We build relationships based on music. I mean, amongst other things, but music is very, very, very important in, the, in who we connect with and who we bond with and you know, sharing experiences, et cetera, et cetera. So when you ask as a brand, is this a brand for someone like me? If you're in music and you're doing it the right way and you're resonating, then you're going to get a big yes. So, you know, we saw a lot of uplift on brand love at Coke and a lot of other brands we've worked with because of that association with music in that way. Staying within internally at brands and when there might be a new idea or a new partnership, new artist partnership being pitched, is it a difficult sell? <laughs> and you've both worked with brands, you know, when it is quite difficult to prove whether it's going to have an impact because there is another party involved. Is that a difficult selling? Yeah, I think it's got harder, like, because of what we kind of spoke about before. I think it used to be very easy, I think, to sit in a room with a brand and put forward an artist or a music program that, depending on the brand and who worked there, like, most, the majority of the people around the table would know and recognize straight away. I think now that's so much more challenging because there's so many artists, everything's so fragmented, it moves so quickly, and someone could come through really quickly. You know, you used to be able to have a lot more longevity as an artist, and so there would be time for that recognition and people to understand that it was a worthwhile investment. I think I think the selling is a lot harder now than it used to be. And who owns music within a brand team, brand marketing? 
I mean, it really depends. I mean, we make the case at the end of the book for a chief music officer, someone that you know sits at the strategic level of brands. Some brands have music people internally. Sometimes it's the marketing team. Sometimes it's the outside agencies, the PR agencies. It does, really depends. And I think that's the thing for music when, you know, when we look at an idea, I'll give you the example. When I was at Coke, whether it was my idea or someone else's idea, before we even entered into a partnership, I would go around to all the different teams. I would go to the PR team and say, hey, if we did this, could you do something with this? Same thing with the digital team, the shopper marketing team, and made sure that we had that sort of, you know, connectivity, that amplification, we had everybody on board. And I think that's where owning music is important. So it's not a matter of who owns it. It's about how you sort of navigate the process. Love that. There's lessons there for all areas of PR and marketing, I think. It is an interesting question, and just to build on it, though, because I feel like it's something that when brands align with me, and every brand in some way has something to do with music, even if it's just like a track that goes across just their advertising or some things, pretty much all of them do. But there's very little, especially brand side, very little music expertise internally. And to your question, you know, we've but all worked in PR agencies where we've been the ones who've been pitching music programs or artists or partnerships in that way. And it's always been like making a real case for it. But we make a case for this in the book because it's kind of baffling that when brands invest so much in music in across all the different touch points of their marketing programs, experiential programs, everything they do. There's rarely an expert internally who can that there was a Coke, and that's why Coke did so well. It was Joe, and he would do take that approach of making sure all the stakeholders were on board with decisions that were made so that he knew that they were going to work across the board in that kind of 360 way. But that's quite rare. And it, it's more surprising that it does the really, it's a great question because I think there should be an owner and a gatekeeper of that internally rather than the recommendations that are coming from every different angle because people have different agendas for putting different things forward and it doesn't always align with what the brand's internal objectives are. So yeah, I mean, it's absolutely why we, I think we'd have a whole chapter that's like the case for a chief music officer and a brand that it really wants to invest properly in music. They should own that. I totally agree. When I found out that I was able to interview you guys, I had a chat with a good friend of mine who does clearing for music. She used to do it on behalf of record labels and now she's an independent, so she works with advertising agencies. And sometimes she'll tell me some of the music that she got cleared for different ads for some major brands. I'm like, That's so cool. What else are they going to do with that? Thinking that there might be a PR campaign, because obviously I'm PR background, but often there isn't. It's just for the ads and then that's it. And I think, oh, what a shame. There's no connection tissue sometimes like everyone operates in silos with this thing and so the, yeah the opportunity is often just really under capitalized on I want to talk about audience again we're all audience and we all love music and we interact with brands but have you seen how it can really sort of change the feeling of, of an audience when you have worked with music on a brand before yeah, I think so. An example is Budweiser. Like I did a lot of work with Budweiser, which were, I think, in the US really, really, they were just always a sports brand or they had a real kind of reputation of like investing heavily in things like the Super Bowl, which is obviously sport, but then also a huge artist halftime shows. And we put together a real grassroots music program for them which was about supporting kind of emerging talent across the world like globally giving talent from every different region around the world a global platform for success and also just for the first time I think that kind of switch in terms of sticking a Budweiser logo on a huge artist like Rihanna versus actually investing in it from the early stages and there was a real marked change in terms of just the kind of public perception of Budweiser as the, I guess an appreciation towards them as investing back into something versus just kind of capitalizing or utilizing it when it was kind of at its peak. There was a real emotional shift, I think, in the audience. And But I don't think it was, a, back to our very original point, the program didn't have the, as much longevity as it should have done to really make a difference because there was a real marked uplift in, in perception in the time that it was running. I love that actually because I was I think when you were talking about some of your other examples both of you about the there's the balance of it being long term but then also with long term you think oh huge investment of money and big artists but that's really nice to hear that it was a grassroots program that that also works well and shifted perceptions 
And another example, which I haven't worked on, was I think is Jaeger, who did such a lovely job of like really investing back into music during COVID and during the lockdowns. And I think that it they managed pretty successfully to evolve their reputation from the Jaeger bomb to actually being like a brand that has a place in culture. We've talked about drinks brands quite a lot. Could brands who maybe aren't so cool as a drink and might have a, a good culture get involved in music as well? Yeah, I think there's actually really simple things that brands can do. And even being really thoughtful and strategic about the music you choose for your advertisements or your content or your TikTok content and thinking about all sides of the equation, right? What fits the brand? What resonates with the audience you're trying to reach and what helps drive the story? This is kind of a quirky example, but one that sticks with me because when I was doing a little research last year, I couldn't help but notice all the comments on YouTube. There was an ad, I don't know if you remember it, of Kia, and they use a song called Skeletons, and it was a Halloween theme, you know, type of ad. Skeletons driving the car it was so on point, but it worked so well because the song was so cool. And it was kind of unknown, at least here it was unknown. And the comments in YouTube, I mean, 90% were about music, you know? And it was just a really, really smart selection that drove the story forward, aligned with the brand and, you know, resonated with the audience they were trying to connect, which was kind of a youthful, cooler audience. So I think, yeah, even the simple things around how you choose music and what music you choose can make a really big impact. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like the coolest cultural music program, you know, use music in a different way, whether in, I think platforms like TikTok have, have really opened up up the way brands can use music and if your brand aligns well with something kind of humorous or quirky there's ways that you can be really clever in the way you align it with music through those channels it doesn't have to be like you know sponsoring the biggest festivals or kind of working with the biggest artists or something there's a place i think for pretty much every brand in music in some way depending on what you you consider your brand personality and objectives to be i think I guess that even hits home on the point that it really needs all of the elements of marketing to work together with that. So that works really well because it had a good rollout on TikTok and across social channels. So you need that team to be involved at the right time and bringing everybody together. It feels like and it really it does got, make a difference. Has it got a good story? Like that's what, I mean, ultimately, like can you tell a story through what you're doing with it? And if you can, then I think that's kind of half your job done. Brilliant. I've only just started the book, so I can't wait to actually go through all of the framework and step by step a lot more. Guys, before I let you go, because we have taken up all of your time before you need to go on to your next appointments. But what's next for both of you personally and for you in your career? You've both had an amazing career, so I'm really interested to know what you're working on now. So right now I'm with a company called Song Creator. We're a music tech B2B company. And what's next? I'll let Rebecca speak to that. We're actually working on a kind of evolution of how music grows brands and that kind of takes that foundation and then looks at how we can use music to actually create some kind of impact, whether it's across health, whether it's across social good purpose, like how you kind of go beyond that foundation of a music brand partnership and actually really kind of shift the dial in some other way. So we're kind of sketching out what that looks like. And then I think kind of more of the same, like I think we've opened up a lot more conversations since the book came out, just about opportunities to really build great brand and music programs and we're having lots of conversations about that and kind of putting some projects together and you know one thing that we're really excited about is taking the foundation of the book and that kind of I guess almost the toolkit part of the book and the methodology and turning that into something that becomes like a real tangible working example or or yeah a tool for either brands or music industry because I've got both of it as a kind of key objective is to really try and get brands to invest as much as they can into some a scene that's so incredibly important and needs that. So, we, you know, everything we're doing at the moment is working towards that. Watch this piece. See, this is a really amazing education piece, like a, a super school oh. <laughs> for music marketing. It's needed. <laughs> the rapid development of technologies, and it's going to continue to change, isn't it, which is why this is ongoing. Guys, thank you so much. It's been fascinating, especially as a personal sort of uh, music fan anyway, and being in marketing, it's been a dream interview. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me. Just quickly, how can people, how can the listeners follow you so they can keep in touch with this great work that you're doing? We are at How Music Grows Brands on Instagram, and then that connects to our personal Instagrams or LinkedIn. We're both on LinkedIn, and that's probably a really good way to get in touch with us. Excellent. Thank you so, so much for your time. 